uh, go to Chicago and uh, we just have talks from uh, some of the best quantum computing experts in the world. So here with us we have uh, Jessica and we have Gwen and, uh, and maybe you can uh, explain a little bit about your background. So sure. Gwen, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I studied physics in the Netherlands and I um, did my PhD in Denmark, Copenhagen, and I specialized in experimental quantum physics. And I worked at a quantum computing startup called Brigetti um, for about a year and a half. And uh, now I'm a software engineer. Cool. Jessica? Uh, yeah, I'm originally from England and also lived in Denmark. Um, for high school and then came to uh, MIT to study physics and computer science and then I uh, transferred to Harvard and uh, got my bachelor's there and then I moved to California uh, to start my PhD in quantum computing at Stanford and uh, that's where I'm at at the moment. Thank you and I'm Jan Larsen by the way, uh, it was my crazy idea uh, 23 years ago to do conferences um, and now we're here. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so what led you to study uh, quantum computing? Um, so I was always very interested in computers in general. My dad was a software engineer, so he gave me all his old toys and books. Um, and then I started coding. Uh, but then I noticed in school that I got really annoyed because uh, the physics teacher wouldn't explain to me how the equations worked. So I was like, maybe I should just study physics because then I can find out. And it turned out to be true. I, I learned everything. I was so excited about it. And then I wanted to combine these two passions, right? Of, physics and, and computing, so that's how I ended up with the quantum computing and actually the school I went to, Delft University of Technology, has a really big um, um, and successful group doing quantum computing in all kinds of different platforms, so I started doing uh, spin qubits, which is a, a platform where you have a, a layered system uh, and you have a layer of electrons so and you isolate of one electron and you use the, the way it spins in a magnetic field to encode a, a qubit, so that's where it went from there. Awesome. And for how many years have you been within the field of quantum computing? Uh, so it's been almost 10 years mm -hmm. um, and I made a switch to biotech now, so oh. I took a little break now from quantum mm -hmm. computing. Mm -hmm. I might go back one day, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, so okay. it's about 8 to 10 years. It's a long time. Jessica? Um, yeah, so when I got to MIT, I always loved physics and knew I wanted to do physics. And then I got into computer science as well and at the, at the point they were also separate interest of mine and then uh, I remember actually I was very vividly I was in the dining hall or like on my laptop and a friend came over and he was like oh I know you're interested in physics and computer science you should take this quantum computing course that this uh, professor is going to teach uh, Seth Lloyd who's one of the pioneers of quantum computing and I said okay maybe I'll try it <laughs> and I ended up uh, taking the, the course like I, I added it super late, but then um, it, was, it was really fascinating and at the time I thought, oh, this is really interesting, so that's how it got started. You fell in love with the quantum computing? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and when was that? Uh, oh, this was my second year in uh, university, so I was a sophomore uh, at MIT, so yeah, a few years ago. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we know you're working with this quantum computing thing, but the, maybe we should talk about what it is. I don't know who wants to, you can explain half of the, the answer each. <laughs> yeah. Jessica is going to do a great job. Okay. Okay. Jessica. Well, um, overall a quantum computer is a new type of computer that can solve certain types of problems significantly faster. And the reason why is because underlying it is quantum physics, which describes how the world works at the level of atoms and subatomic particles such as electrons. For example, on a normal computer, you have bits, zeros and ones. I have this to oh, demonstrate. Yeah. Can we have a bite? <laughs> yeah. For example, this is a zero and this is a one. But on a quantum computer, you can have a quantum bit, which can also be a superposition of zero and one. And it's like a spinning donut, because if I ask you, is it zero or one? You'd say, well, it's a combination of both. And we can use superposition and other quantum effects to give us advantages in the quantum computer to solve problems faster. Cool explanation. <laughs> so has this all to do something with what Einstein was working on and uh, maybe Gwen can you relate it to Einstein's work? 
Um, Einstein, it's definitely during that time. So Einstein was actually one of the physicists who had really like philosophical and, and religious sort of problems with quantum uh, quantum mechanics. It's more like people like Niels Bohr and Erwin uh, Another Dane. Another Dane, yeah. yeah. Famous Dane. <laughs> Um, who, have, who, have, who have laid the foundation of this work and, and defined uh, what, what quantization means and how energy works at these small scales. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how, yeah, so um, do we have a notion of certainty within the quantum world? Who um, wants to give a go at that? Because, because yeah. this spinning donut seems yeah. a little bit, what is it? Is it a zero? Is it a one? Yeah, so the, there are all sorts of probabilities associated with um, these quantum states. And the goal is we want to create a quantum algorithm. So this, these are a set of instructions that you give to the quantum computer. And your goal when you're creating this algorithm is to have it so that you have a high probability of getting the right answer. And usually we want to design it, for example, that there's a 99% probability of getting the right answer. And if you theoretically know it should be 99% and you run it and it is around 99%, then that's how you can get certainty uh, that um, you've got the right answer. Ideally, we get 100% probabilities, but um, that's not always possible. I think we're getting more and more used to probability because also within AI, you know, when you do facial recognition and stuff like that, it's, it's like you have a probability that this is Gwen, you know, with 95% certainty, <laughs> yeah. it could also be Sarah uh, or another yeah. person, but we think it's it's Gwen. You know? yeah. So we're getting more and more used to computing with uncertainty in a way. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I think exactly this question is what also bothered Einstein. Mm -hmm. um, he said famously, uh, God does not play dice. So this was really a, a fundamental problem people had, and it took a while. It took, actually took the hippie movement for people to actually accept that that our world is not deterministic. You have all these probabilities. Um, so when you ask like, oh, what is certainty in a quantum world? It's actually a good thing that you know everything's not predefined. You know, like we have an actual like it, it. It makes the possibility of free will more plausible, right? Because you have all these interactions, right? A lot of people say like. It's nature versus nurture, and the decisions you make in life are just based on your environment and how you grew up and, and what you've been exposed to. But the fact that there is this fundamental, on the fundamental quantum level, there is this probability and uncertainty, like philosophically, gives, gives you this notion of, of free will and freedom. Cool stuff. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but I should add a note that um, it's not like sort of all random probabilities. Uh, we, we can design yeah. it so that we know yeah. what the probability should be, which is maybe. Yeah different in um, doing a neural network, sometimes you may not know what the probability will be, but in this case we do know, okay, this will be the probability, we'll get this outcome, and then we can verify it in the actual quantum We'll get back to it when we look at how it's actually working, and, and how we can build computers today. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what are the potential applications of uh, quantum computing? Uh, how does the programs look like? Um, so I think that's probably more of a Jessica question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but I think there's a lot of uh, potential applications. The most uh, prominent one is uh, quantum chemistry. So I'm sure you're working in that field as well. Yeah, and um, yeah, as um, yeah, in quantum chemistry, we want to basically simulate a model how particular molecules work. That can that can be used in medicine or um, in materials. And it, it makes sense, right, because a quantum computer is a quantum system, so you want to use that to simulate a quantum system. So that's one of the most promising applications of quantum computing. But there's also this um, thing about just um, solving hard problems, like mm -hmm. uh, cryptography and yeah. things like this. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. Yeah. So, so uh, actually one of the sort of algorithms that really push the, the field forward was Shor's algorithm, which can um, basically you know, find the prime factors of a really large number. And so that is one potential application, you could say. Um, another one is in machine learning and AI. Uh, so there's a field called quantum machine learning, and it looks at, uh, basically in machine learning, you have vectors and matrices in a high dimensional space. And in quantum computing, you also, the underlying mathematics is very similar. So the idea is you can map the two together and use quantum computers to speed up some machine learning algorithms. I think now we can touch also about the security thing because uh, 
many of us fear that once you have these uh, big quantum computers, you can actually hack into any system and steal our money. So, uh, will you be the future hackers, or, or what are we looking at? That's the plan. Quantum <laughs> hackers. It's a good business plan. Yeah. So, how how do we how do we protect ourselves against um, kind of the threat of uh, quantum computers hacking yeah. our 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 accounts. Yeah, it's funny because um, there's this uh, uh, guy called Bob Sutor at IBM and he gets this question and the first thing he says is maybe companies should just first of all encrypt their data just normally <laughs> and then they can start thinking about quantum safe encryption, okay. right? Because a lot of companies don't even encrypt their data no. in the first place. So, <laughs> so I think that's interesting. but. Um, so I think on the company side, it's probably something that people aren't thinking about. But it is an active area of research in the cryptography side to try and build new uh, methods that could be safe against quantum computers. And so people are actively trying to do this. Uh, and it's important that we do think about it now because it could take a while to actually replace all of our systems. But it's not something, it's not going to happen like, you know, within the next few months or anything because in order to actually run the algorithm to like break into RSA or um, or, or, or alike, you need to actually have a quantum computer that's powerful enough to do that, and currently we don't have that. Okay, yeah. that's that's good. Yeah. At least for, from that <laughs> <Now>. point of view. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so here's another cool question. You know, is like uh, oh. can we can we use <laughs> quantum question. computers for time travel? This is a new question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Time yeah. travel. <laughs> so I did actually recently stumble upon work where they demonstrated time reversal symmetry using quantum computing, using quantum circuits. So that's not really the same as time travel, um, but it does sort of demonstrate this fundamental theory about time um, in, in a quantum circuit. So and that was for communication because this entanglement. Yeah. Is it true that the two qubits entangled uh, over a long distance that they will be 100% synchronized and not you know bound to the speed of light or anything can you can you elaborate a little bit on that yeah um, actually I want to go back to the time travel thing there is okay. something called uh, quantum teleportation oh. so you can teleport uh, quantum bits uh, and actually that's one of the first things I learned in the quantum computing course I took uh, yeah, so, so that's also interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, in terms of entanglement, yeah, so you, so it could, I think there have been experiments done where they separate some quantum bits far distance and they're actually able to, uh, yeah, get this correlation between the measurements of the two uh, qubits. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So it's also called the spooky action at a distance, is what the, the early quantum theorists called it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's spooky because we don't know what it is. We, we, can't, we can't actually visualize it mentally, like what's going on. But you can, there has been experiments done uh, where using photons, so something we call flying qubits. So the qubits that, that, that you work on when you do quantum computation, they're actually solid state qubits, so like electrons or microwave photons. But you also have these uh, flying qubits where you take, for example, um, um, a, a lattice uh, uh, irregularity in diamond and then uh, entangle that with a photon and that photon can uh, dis like travel large distances so there has been an experiment done in, in China I believe where they actually bounced a photon off of a satellite oh. over like a large like kilometers distance wow. uh, and entangled them with an inch again. Cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, really Let's cool. look at uh, what we have. Um, so, so now let's Get down to earth. You know? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so, uh, so who right. on earth is <laughs> are making these computers nowadays? Let's uh, have a look at that. Well, you you I, I worked at one. So yeah. there's a startup called Rigetti in Berkeley. Okay. Uh, they're building uh, solid state quantum mm -hmm. computers. Mm -hmm. And there's um, uh, IBM in uh, New York, New York Ten Hunts. Mm -hmm. They're also building similar uh, technology. Um, and then there's Microsoft, and they are um, they're building uh, something called Majorana qubit. So it's a very different type, of, fundamentally different type of qubit, um, which is still very early in, in development. But uh, its promise is really big because once you can create these special uh, qubits, you don't have the problem of, of quantum decoherence anymore. Um, and then Google is also developing the solid state qubits. 
And any smaller startups? Yeah, there's actually lots of startups. Mm -hmm. um, Surprisingly, there's over like 100 startups across the world that are working on this, and some of them are focusing just on the quantum algorithms, so they call themselves quantum software companies, yeah. um, and other ones are actually like regretting trying to physically build the quantum computer. So it's a lot of. Can you buy them today? No. <laughs> you can buy like time. If you had a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> you can buy time on. A... Yeah. Time, yeah. So it's like a cloud offering, yeah. 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 Quantum. Clouds. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how how are they built? I mean, how do you build this stuff? These computers. Can you? Uh... Um, so how do you build a quantum computer? Um, so a quantum computer essentially what it is it's a quantum device or an integrated circuit that um, can encode quantum information. Um, so uh, to be able to actually do that, uh, once you you have the chip which you can create using lithography, so conventional lithography methods. Um, you also need very high uh, uh, resolution, so you typically use um, electron beam lithography for that. Um, and once you have that chip, to actually be able to store the quantum information and retain it, you need to cool it down to almost absolute zero. So typically these systems are cooled down using something called a dilution refrigerator, which is a really big machine, it's about the size of like a, a closet, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, that cycles liquid helium in a dilute phase to cool down the system to, to these low temperatures. Um, so, so you, yeah, so you need a few different things. You need somebody to design the qubits, somebody to actually fabricate the qubits, and then you need experimental uh, team to cool down the system and tune it. Um, and then you need a whole software stack on top of that to be able to program it, to be able to create classical registers that can talk to these quantum registers. So you need a bunch of hardware that can interface with this quantum chip and send the right signals to it. Um, and you need CPUs, so you need a, a, a regular computer to be able to control this hardware. Mm -hmm. Can you add something to that, the different architectures of building quantum computers? Yeah, um, so uh, there are many actually different ways of building a quantum computer. So you mentioned um, one way, and uh, for example, you can use photons, which is light. You can use uh, trapped ions. You can even use diamonds, as you mentioned. Uh, so there's actually it's quite an exciting time because there's many different ways to build physically build the quantum computer, and people are trying to like basically scale up these quantum computers and see which one is the best and at the moment each one has its own advantages and disadvantages um, for example some will be more reliable but um, others not or vice versa so yeah interesting okay so um, so there is this thing that we that quantum computers are, are still very small um, we mentioned earlier today that uh, between 50 and 72 uh, qubits quantum computers and we would like to have billions of qubits to really solve super hard problems. Um, but is there a way to just uh, cluster a number of smaller quantum computers? Because if you can build like a 50 qubit computer, maybe you can just build a hundred of them. How would that work? Yeah. So the main thing is, if you have multiple quantum computers mm -hmm. and you want to connect them together, mm -hmm. you're probably connecting it classically. Right? Yeah. There's a classical communication, but really the power of quantum computing is the ability to have these quantum effects, to entangle them together. And so the problem with just taking multiple quantum computers and just connecting them classically is that you basically, you basically lose the, the quantum effects and you lose the power that it gives you. Uh, say if you had an actual quantum computer with all of those qubits. Mm. You could, yeah. Yeah, so you need something uh, called like a quantum link to be able to do this. So like Jessica mentioned, right now the only way we can actually connect them is classically. And classically meaning like through Ethernet cables or, or, or through like a direct cable uh, signal cable between them. Um, but in order to actually have like a full range thousand qubit um, lattice, you need to be able to take like five qubits from one chip and connect them quantum mechanically to five qubits in the other chip. And that's big that, Yeah, that's exactly. So to do that, you need a quantum link. So there are this research ongoing to create uh, links between different systems. So we mentioned there's there's the diamonds, there's the, the superconducting integrated circuit qubits, um, and there's the spin qubits, and all these systems have different ways of interacting between each other. Um, so there's there's 
a lot of research groups working on creating a link between like a solid state qubit and, and, and more of like a, a photon based system such that you can entangle a quantum state in a, in a solid state circuit to like a photon which you can then send over a fiber cable okay. to another um, quantum computer. But this is really difficult because, yeah. yeah, I mean the problem doesn't scale very well, right? Because then you have to, I don't know, you have to kind of have 50 like cables going to to 50 connectors and, and imagine scaling that up. So yeah, that's still a big open problem is how you can actually distribute, do distributed quantum computing. Mm. Okay. So uh, so now we already talked about some of the challenges, um, and I guess um, in, in talking about the algorithms, maybe we can talk a little bit about them. So uh, because you can also fix the algorithms, so they don't need these giant uh, quantum computers. Uh, can you explain some of the developments there? Yeah. So um, one of the challenges in quantum computing is if we go back to the human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we don't <laughs> So it's spinning, but you see, oh, eventually it does stop spinning, and it's also similar in quantum computing. Eventually, you lose the quantum effects, and this means that if you think of the uh, computation as you know, sets of operations, that means we can't do many operations because it just ends up we just it just ends up being a mess at the end. So that means we can only do a short number of operations. And as a result of that, um, researchers have come up with new types of algorithms, in particular they're called hybrid quantum classical algorithms. So the idea is you use a quantum computer and a classical computer together. And the idea is on the quantum computer, because we can only do a short number of operations, we do that short number of operations and then we take its output to a classical computer, we do some processing on the classical computer, and then it spits out like new things that we should do on the quantum computer. And then we kind of do this loop between them. And the idea is to take advantage of the fact that we have a quantum computer, but it has a small number of operations. And it's also an open question whether this is actually useful, <laughs> or whether we can do things that um, like solve really interesting problems significantly faster. But these type of algorithms have been built. OK. I think we should talk a little bit about um, the different gates that we have, mm -hmm. because I think that's really interesting. Because once you hear about these spinning things and you think, okay, how do you actually build stuff like that? And, and I think a lot of our audience, they are used to like all gates, AND gates, XORs, and, and what have we. But in, in the quantum computing area, you call, you, you call it something else. So maybe you can explain the different kind of uh, gates and, and, uh, that we have and how they work. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I can explain the gate and you can say how you actually implement okay, it. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are different Maybe types you need of... you don't want. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I could. He's the, first, the, first, the first thing is about, you know, if you want to read a state, right? Yeah, yeah so, um, so, as I mentioned, during the actual algorithm, you want, you want the qubits to be in superposition and in entanglement. But the thing is, at the end, information is just zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. So how do we actually get that? Well, we can do a thing called a measurement. Mm -hmm. So if it's um, in superposition, for example, I can make a measurement and force it to land on either side. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, force it in such a way that the probability of it landing on the correct side is the one we want. And there are different uh, types of gates that we can do before that. So for example, you can have uh, the equivalent of a NOT gate where you have, it's called an X gate in quantum computing, but it's zero and you can flip it to one. You can have a gate where, called the Hadamard gate, where it's zero and then you put it through the gate. I don't have a gate, but you can imagine I put it through a gate and then it ends up spinning. Ah. And you um, create the, the spinning superposition. Yes, qubit. by putting it through the gate. And then uh, I think Ryan can actually explain how you actually implement that on a real quantum computer. Yeah. I, I love that donut. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. Um, it's cool. So, yeah, so I, I, maybe uh, it, it's easier to think of a quantum processor even though it's different than a regular CPU, right? So, in a regular CPU, what you have is you have these, oh, they're literally gates, right? They're like open or closed, right? So, transistors and so on. And, and how that works is you have that the data flows through the gates, right? So, I have ones and zeros, and they, they basically go around and, and circuits um, and you, you put in, a, it's like a black box, right? You put in a one and you get something out like a zero or, or you can put in a one, one, one and you get a zero, zero, zero. Um, however, in a quantum chip, it works fundamentally differently. So instead of having the data flow through the gates, the data is the chip. So, so in a, a CPU, the gates are the chip, 
but in a quantum process new it's QPU, the the um, the data is a chip, mm. right? So you have the gates go actually go to the data. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a flip in, 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 in how how to think about it. So to answer your question, like how do you implement these gates? Is um, it, it really depends on the system. For example, in a in a microwave circuit, so in the the, the, the superconducting qubit system used by uh, Rigetti, Google, and, uh, and IBM, is uh, you send microwave pulses. So I have a little antenna um, that it, it's a little bit similar to uh, RFID. Are you familiar with like the RFID technology? So, yeah. Yeah, so you, you have a car and you beep, yeah. right? So yeah. it's, it's really like a, a small transceiver. So you, you send a signal and you get a signal back. That's yeah. similar to how these superconducting qubits work, except that they're much, much smaller and they're much, much colder. Yeah. So what happens in, in a normal like resonant circuit is you have different different um, frequencies, right? They have different harmonics that you can send. Like you can send, like it's like with a guitar string, right? So I can, I can have uh, one note and then I have a higher harmonic of all these energies, but in a, a quantum circuit, because it's, it's, it behaves inherently quantum mechanically, you can actually see much more well-defined levels of these, these harmonics, and you can isolate, so in, in, a, in, a, in a transmog qubit, I induce a non-linearity, such that you can actually isolate two of these levels, and, and those are my quantum information. So what you do is you set the microwave pulse to um, um, excite that transition. Makes sense. So this is kind of more like a physicsy way of saying it, but you, you um, play the qubits. You, you, you play you you play like a yeah. you play a program on the qubit. Yeah. So so in the donut example, you give it a, a whack, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah. that's literally how you would do it. Yeah. Instead of giving it a physical whack, you, you give it a whack yeah. with a microwave. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. I see. I see where this is going. Good. So um, <laughs> okay. So so right now you, you said one of the challenges are that uh, if we have a qubit in superposition, you know, you want it to spin forever until you do something with it or you read it. So um, how long can they will they live today or spin today? How how long will they maintain the superposition? Yeah. So current systems, I think the best ones measured are in the range of like 100 to 200 microseconds, but those are really difficult to reproduce. So we, we still have to figure out how to reproduce that. So actually reproducibility wise, we're more in the range of like 50 microseconds. And I think Jessica can give a better um, uh, insight into how what that means for circuit depth and how yeah. many algorithms that can run. I mean, your donut spins longer. <laughs> yeah, it does. Maybe we just go back to the that thing. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> Donut computing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, as you said, it's only on the order of microseconds, which is extremely short. And so then the idea is like, how many like operations can you fit in in that amount of time? And then you can imagine that's why it's a very uh, small amount of operations that we can do in those uh, few seconds. Microseconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so um, so what about the um, the, uh, the implementation of these physical computers, and, and how do you deal with the, the errors and, and the imperfections of the, those computers? Yeah, so there's a whole field, like in, the, in quantum information theory, called quantum error correction, mm -hmm. which I don't understand. <laughs> it's a it's a whole area, and it, it, it deals with like how to fix quantum errors. Mm -hmm. And if you're working in the field, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So, um, okay, so we go back to the qubit, <laughs> and when I talk about the quantum algorithms and this qubit, I'm actually referring to a logical qubit. So I'm assuming this qubit is perfect. So when I put it through the Hadamard gate, it ends up spinning 100% of the time. When I put it through a flip gate, it ends up flipping it. But what happens is. Uh, when you actually build this on the hardware, it, it doesn't, it's not perfect, it doesn't happen like that. So what we want to do is we can actually add more qubits. So this is what quantum error correction does is we're basically, let's say we now have three qubits and these three qubits actually sort of represent one qubit. So it allows us to basically detect an error if it happens and then correct the error. And there are a whole bunch of errors, for example, if, you, if I put it through the X gate, an error might happen that I put it through the X gate, but it ends up still zero. That's an error, because it should be flipping it. Or um, there are other types of errors, or the other types of errors, you could say are to just to do with noise. 
um, which is this idea of eventually it's just going to stop spinning. And so if you're doing computation farther down the line, there's like errors there where it just ends up not being fully perfect. Okay, thank yeah. you. So, um, so what already works today? I mean, what can you actually do with a quantum computer today? What is the most practical application that you can do? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's actually, I think so. There are um, so I think the most like prominent application I've seen so far is understanding classical algorithms better, <laughs> which is a little bit like it sort of sounds like it defeats the purpose, but I don't actually think it does. So there's this really talented researcher. Her name is Yuan Tang, um, who shook up the quantum community. Like you no, know, like people were upset about this, <laughs> and she wrote two papers. Um, about uh, two di or about quantum algorithms, but implemented them classically, mm -hmm. and she outperformed the original classical equivalent okay. using another classical algorithm that was was inspired by the quantum algorithm. Right. So you can you can take this negatively and say, oh yeah, we don't need quantum computers. Like this is nonsense, right? Uh, or you can say, like, look, actually studying these systems gives us better insight into how to solve classical problems because you look at it from a very different perspective. You basically you take uh, problems that you would normally just walk through one by one, and you actually like map them onto like something like a, a wave function, like a probability. So you think you think about problems differently. I think that's now the most practical application. And then you just have to give one example of what you can actually do with it. Uh, so, so the thing is, yeah. So people ask me, like, well, you can actually run a, a lot of different types of algorithms on a real quantum. Computer. You can run machine learning algorithms on a quantum computer. The only thing is, it's like limited, right? It's like you can run Grover search, which is the one where you can search for a number in a square root of the number of entries that you have. You can run a very small example of Shor's algorithm. I think there was actually a new recent announcement that you know, they hit a larger limit in terms of the prime factors. So you can actually run a lot of algorithms. Um, the only thing is, it, it's all limited in terms of, you have a limited number of qubits, and so you can't do anything that you cannot do on a classical no. computer at the moment. And this is a, people are working on this to try and actually do something yeah. that would be very difficult to do on a classical computer, um, but do it on a quantum computer. So what do you call the moment where you actually can beat a classical computer calculating a yeah. problem? So, so there's actually multiple terminology for this. Um, so there's okay. So there's a quantum speed up, which says that, um, for example, if you have an algorithm running in exponential time, and you run it in polynomial time, then you get an exponential speed up, a quantum speed up. Uh, you can also say quantum advantage, where that is, uh, you get a quantum advantage from a particular algorithm. And there's another terminology called quantum supremacy, and this is a bit more specific, but it says, if we were to run something on a quantum computer, would it outperform the best classical hardware running this task? And this is a, something that Google, for example, is trying to get out there, because they said, oh, we're going to do this quantum supremacy experiment, and people are waiting, when is it coming? So, but the thing is, that might not actually be a useful problem, and I think, um, I think the problem they're working on is not actually, like, could you, could you use it or not? People don't know any applications of it, but it, it, it would probably be possible within hopefully like the next year or like months, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so so you're, yeah. you're talking about a few months or years before that? Kind of uh, the quantum supremacy, yeah. but the, the thing is, it, 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 may, it's, it may not be actually useful, if that makes sense. It, it will be a very like, small mm -hmm. mathematical problem mm -hmm. that we could do on a quantum computer in just a matter of seconds, which may take a classical computer like, I don't know, hours or months um, or days. But, but whether it's actually useful is another thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you actually working on right now? I mean, in the field of quantum computing, what are the, what are the problems you really need to solve right now? Yeah. Uh, so I like to use the acronym MAPS. Um, I'm from the UK, so we say MAPS yep. instead of MAPS. Yep. <laughs> right, you can say MAPS here. But uh, the, it stands for M, Milestone. So this is the milestone I talked about. Outperform the best classical hardware running the best classical al algorithm. Then A stands for Applications. So we need to continue to find new applications of quantum computing, design new algorithms to do this. Then T stands for Theory. 
So uh, theoretically, if we know that there are more problems that can be um, hard classically but easy quantumly, that could drive a lot of research because we're like reassured that okay, like there's something there that it. we can go for. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, then H is hardware. We need to improve, like increase the number of qubits as well as the quality of the qubits and reducing the error. And then S is finally like shifting our mindset, as you said, from this classical world to the quantum world, which is interesting because, yeah, it helps us actually develop better classical algorithms, possibly. Um, but that, I think, would help us develop even better uh, quantum algorithms. Interesting. I can add to the hardware part of it. So sort of the holy grail right now in uh, superconducting transform qubits is uh, actually um, the third dimension. So you have these integrated circuits, right? Um, but that, that forces you to make a flat structure to, of qubits, while if you can do like vertical integration, uh, you can connect like qubits in, in three dimensions. Um, and that's, that's sort of what now one, is, one of the biggest problems that the field is trying to solve. So is there a more slower in quantum computing? <laughs> have you been tracking the, the number of qubits over time? Yeah, there's something called Rents Rule. Rents Rule? Um, Rents okay. Rule, yeah. So there's a paper on that actually written by um, a collaboration between Intel and Delft mm -hmm. uh, that tells you that the number of connections you can actually make to this chip is limited fundamentally. Um, so yeah, so that's also why people are trying to solve this, this vertical integration problem. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of the equivalent of Moore's Law. Okay. Yeah, in terms of the number of qubits, um, well, an important thing to note is, um, you know, Moore's Law is like, oh, we have more transistors, but in qubits, actually doesn't, the number of qubits is important, but also the quality of the qubits. You could just add, like, hundreds of qubits, yeah. fine, but they could all be, like, very poor quality, and then it wouldn't give you much. So actually, it would be much better to have, like, you know, like, 20 really, really good qubits than hundreds of, like, really bad qubits. And so, there's an important thing to think of when we track qubits, but from my understanding, um, I mean, IBM released their, like, five qubit quantum computer, I think, in 2016, and so now they said they have 50 qubits. So that is, that is, um, that is doubling every year, but uh, whether that continues, <laughs> or, like, what is the quality of those qubits is, up for debate. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's actually a website that just shows how many qubits, I think it's called how many qubits in the quantum computer .com or something like that. Okay. Yeah. It just tracks how many qubits are announced oh, by yeah, this company, yeah. but like Jessica says, it doesn't really tell you anything because you don't yeah. know what the quality is going to be like. So what are the, the new types of uh, algorithms that we have in, in, in quantum computing? Yeah, I think we talked about like, yeah. the hybrid quantum task for algorithms. Yeah. 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 That's what we want to do yeah. for now until we have bigger quantum computers. Yeah. And I think quantum machine learning is, is one of the new latest and greatest people are working on. Yeah. So, um, so you probably get asked a lot, how, how do we get into this field? How, how can you get started if you watch this interview or one of your talks and you say, I want to do it now. You know? how, can, how can you get started? Yeah, I mean, see, I mean, I think it depends on how, like, what you want to sort of get out of it. There are actually a lot of exciting resources out there right now. If you want to just play around with a quantum computer, I recommend you can go to the Google IBM Q experience. You can literally drag and drop gates and try it out, or you can use an API. I think Bugatti has an open source API too, where you can actually write Python code to actually code on a real quantum computer. If you want more of the actual theory, the, the most famous book is called Isaac, uh, oh sorry, Schwang and Nielsen, so by Isaac Schwang and Michael Nielsen, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information, and this is used in almost like all introductory to quantum computing courses. And this will give you the mathematics and it will give you a good solid foundation for actually how it works. Uh, yeah. Yeah, as a, uh, I can add to that like in terms of jobs, if you're interested to work in the field, um, if you're like an electronics radio person, like a microwave um, um, engineer, there's a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. or FPGA programming, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're more of a software engineer, I recommend starting with, with what Jessica mentioned and, and just, you know, start coding, coming up with your own algorithms. Okay, so uh, thank you. Both of you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I think we all learned a lot here, and um, I hope you have a, a great conference.
uh, here in Chicago. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah.